Hello everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. Sitting here with my good friend Mr. Pete Dell, how are you? I are good, thank you so awfully. Well, I'm so <laughs> <laughs> You've had a rather storied career. I made it to the second story anyway. Made it to the second story, well the first one was decades long, that's rather good. <laughs> well that's a good point though, because you did start off, well, I suppose three chapters? You're a musician, then you become a recording engineer, and I'd love to get into some of those records that we were talking about earlier. And now, you know, here at Aftermaster, and you're mastering records on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, I think of my, this third incarnation, the third chapter here as like a new thing, but I've been doing it 17 years already. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Yeah, I understand. Turn around and 17 years have gone by. But that'd be good. So where did you start from? Where, where were you born? I came from Rochester, New York. And the joke about Rochester is there are only three seasons in Rochester, June, July, winter are the three seasons. <laughs> and the good thing about growing up in a cold climate like that, it, it forces you to keep your ass in the house and practice. A lot of great musicians came from that neck of the woods. It was a sort of fertile ground for me. Uh, I ended up getting a degree from Albany, the capital of, of, of New York State. And I went to the university there. I got a degree in electronic music composition. Oh, I was, wow. I was playing in bands and uh, one day I was in the uh, music building and a door opened and I see these multi-track Scully tape machines. What class do I have to take to get in that room? Because I already, you know, from playing in bands and my, my, my brother, my older brother had already got me in the bug of building hi-fi. We built, cons uh, you know, tube amps and, you know, for hi-fi, not for, not for. Uh, Still amazing. Yeah, but yeah, because he was, he was a, a geek. So I got the bug from, from him, and like I say, I saw these uh, multi-track machines, and I thought, I know if I ever got in the proximity of all this technology, I too could learn how to make records, because that was really my, my avocation. And people like John Cage, I got to study with him. John, John was at the school at the same well, time? Well, he'd be wandering through as one of the, you know, like, guest oh, fantastic. artists and whatnot. And uh, the guy who was my mentor, my uh, professor, was a... Uh, a guy who was another icon in that in that style of music, and a guy named Joel Chatterby, wonderful man, he's still around. So I got my my teeth sharpened, if you will, on that kind of music, and uh, learned a lot of about the, how to record all kinds of music, not just electronic stuff. But the electronic stuff, you know, now people talk about electronic music and it's EDM, you sure. know, and the stuff that I did, you know, God, fifty freaking years ago, uh, had there was no keyboards. We weren't trying to do vertical harmony. We already have orchestras to do that shit, right? We were trying to like do more, more like what, I guess what you call today sound design. You know, nice. really completely different, you know, exploring new things. And of course, because it, you're making up everything, there's a lot of naive, less than stellar music because it, you had to make every decision and not a lot of them are great. How did you get into that room? Did you actually go in there and, uh, yeah. and study in there a, a guy and increase in my, your degree? A guy in my band, he was already in the electronic music thing, and it was through him that I got my foot in the door. And <laughs> my, my parents weren't too thrilled that I took a left from my biology major with an eye on becoming a, an MD and took a left and got into electronic music. I, it's, it's okay, Mom, there's a, there's a master plan. Yeah, right. <clears throat> I think you've done okay. Well, I, I've been I've been lucky. I mean, I've been out here in LA many decades already, and I haven't been out of work like a day or more than a couple of days in all this time that I didn't take off. I mean, I am a lucky man. That's for damn sure. As far as that, you, know. you make your own luck. You work yeah. very hard at it yeah. and get get great skills, and it pays off. No. I'm sure, you work many eighteen hour, possibly day, night, next day sessions. I know I have. <laughs> oh man. I worked for Capitol Studios here in town for 15 years from like 83 to 99. And I worked 80 to 100 hours a week, every week for all those years. I mean, the skyscraper record, the David Lee Roth record, which was the, I think the second one that Steve Vai. I was about produced. to say, I love the record Steve Vai's playing. Yeah, he's, he's, he was a trip, but that record, I worked three months and it was 120, 140 hours a week. 140 hours a week means tw 20 hours a day on the clock. That's not four hours of sleep a day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
you know, there were some memorable times. I mean, if I, I could remember them. I bought the record when it came out. Yeah. Wait, there's that, that Saz Paradise on it? This must yeah. be just like... Yeah, it's a yeah. great song. Yeah. 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 And Steve Vai was, you know, a Zappa kid. Oh, so yeah. Incredible. his idea of how you made a record was 30 hours on, three hours off, 30 hours on, three hours on, you know, rinse and repeat. Well, it's interesting. When I look around your room, for instance, and I don't want to gloss over tons of stuff we've got to talk about, there's this, you know, of all the records that you've done, and there's hundreds and hundreds of them. Well, most of them are next door. In the... No, but you're picking <laughs> things that I think, um, you know, the fact that sc Skyscraper's over there. Yeah. And I've done a couple of those albums, in one nine-month, one year-long record that are just like, take out your heart and rip it up and shreds, and, you know, you're like, oh, you live and breathe it. <laughs> And you can't really, you know, it's going to be with you for the rest of your life. So I understand the significance. There's something quite incredible to the right-hand side, which I'd like to get to in a moment. But let's see if we can keep the chronological order going up, because you've got so many great moments. I would hate to miss any of them. Well, at, when I left the birthing ground, you know, electronic music at the, at the university, I, I shortly thereafter moved to Boston. And I was mm -hmm. in Boston through much of the 70s and was playing music by night, and I got into the recording studios there, and you know, was occasionally playing on sessions, but mostly I was engineering. What studios were there in the 70s in Boston? I worked at a place which was long gone, and now has been resuscitated. It was in Jamaica Plain, which is a very Latin part of town, and uh, it was called Dimension Sound, and the place has been resuscitated, repurchased, and I've seen pictures on Facebook of Incredible. It. It's really similar to what, the way it was umpteen years ago, except instead of having, you know, an analog audio designs console and a 24 track, now they have, you know, probably some avid console workstation and, you know, it's all Pro Tools and whatnot. But the look of the, the, the recording areas are virtually the same after all these years. Now, I don't know if it was frozen in amber like in a receivership for a long time, because I do know that the the guys who owned it passed away and didn't have any heirs, so it was possibly something like that, that that's why it's almost intact. So you're working there, what records did you make there? This last year I got to master a, a record for Joe Perry, a, mm -hmm. one of his solo records, and I reminded him that I had gotten to work with Aerosmith, this is like 75 or something, back in, at that studio. A George Thurgood record that everybody would know, of course, I can't remember the title of it, but I had, you know, one bourbon, one scotch, one beer, and, yeah. you know, some other big ones that, back in the halcyon days of, you know, big budget records, you know, you'd spend months on a record and you could remember yeah. lots of details. Especially now with mastering, it might be a, a day or half a day that I do an album. Yep. You know? Uh, so, and especially with this business, the way it is now, stuff comes over the internet, it goes out over the internet. I rarely see a human being. Sure. It's emails and, you know, uploads and downloads and stuff. Well, it's nice to be seen here in your room. <laughs> it's um, good to have humans. So Boston, was there any memorable sort of successes from there? Or where well, did you one, go from? One of, one of the fun things I did when I was a, a, a player there is, well, in the studio, there were uh, there was a client did the music for a couple of big TV shows that were on uh, public television, uh, Zoom and the Electric Company. They were both very successful. We did the music for it, and this guy Newt Wayland was the the composer musical guy. And when John before John when when uh, Arthur Fiedler, who had been the the conductor of the Boston Pops, died, and before they replaced with John Williams, there was a period of I don't know a year or something where they were trying various guest conductors, and our man Newt Whalen got to conduct the Pops a couple times, and I got to play with the Pops, play, play bass. Wow, that's amazing. What, For those of you who don't know the Boston Pops, as soon as you wiki it, you'll get a pretty good perspective it, on yeah, it. It's, it's pretty uh, amazing. Yeah, but it was uh, a very kind of unique thing, and uh, you know, to play with a big orchestra. Incredible. And I was just playing electric bass. I wouldn't because when the guys in the section had to play electric bass, they would let you know that they didn't like doing this by playing either the wrong notes or you know the worst possible sound, you know, <laughs> to tell you I don't want to do this. So he was able to get me to 
I just played a couple of times, but it was a hoot. Other things, uh, bass playing highlights, I got to play the Ice Capades once or twice. The Ice Capades. Ice Capades, right? and then when you get really toasted at the end of the Ice Capades, you <laughs> get on the Zamboni machine and drive it around. Nice. <laughs> Bucket list. Yeah, that was fun. And uh, then from Boston, what was the next uh, stage? I, 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 I had kind of run out of room in Boston, uh, you know, engineering-wise and playing-wise, and I thought, you know, Jesus, if I went to the deep end of the pool and tried with either the bass playing or the engineering thing, one, maybe one of them would take off. So I moved out here to L.A. and So you didn't go to New York first? It came straight No, out. and I looked at it, but, you know, first off, it was every bit as cold in New York as it was in Boston. <laughs> but, you know, what is big in, I mean, Broadway, obviously, is big there. There's a bunch of TV most of the records were being done out here on the on the west coast and i had a few friends who had migrated out here already so it was easier to you know like crash on somebody's couch and you know kind of get the lay of the land what year was this 1980 80 okay and when i arrived it was in the midst of a musician strike <laughs> one of the things i had done in boston in the last year a couple of years uh i did a lot of society gigs you know playing the tux and you play weddings or bowling banquets, anything, you know, but you play with some great musicians. Oh, I'm sure. Great musicians. Probably all sight reading. And, and I would do like 10 gigs a week. Amazing. I mean, I would make good dough. I mean, it was, it was a fun time. So when I came out of here, I had connections in that world. And like I say, the musician strike, you do a wedding and here's Shelly Mann and Lee Rittenauer in the band. Mm -hmm. It's like, because there were, were no sessions going on, right? So that was kind of fun, but it was it was challenging because I remember, uh, you know, there were a lot of great musicians in Boston, and obviously tons of great musicians out here. But every knucklehead and his brother are out here too. So to find your way into the midst of something that was musically challenging and fun and that paid something was really hard. I remember, <laughs> I remember I had an audition with Weird Al Yankovic. Now, musically, it's a fucking top 40 band. I mean, mm -hmm. it's all cover tunes, musically, right? Sure. And, you know, I, I remember them saying, well, you know, there's really no money in it. What do you mean there's no money in it? He's getting paid, you know. He'd already had a couple of hits and was playing. He had massive hits, yeah. You know, and it's like, no, I'm not playing for free, you know, for the honor of playing with this knucklehead. Like I said, it's, it's a top 40 band other than his funny lyrics. So there was there were some silly things to encounter, but I joined a band, and the singer's husband actually the singer had a record deal. I think her name is Karen Tobin. Still a great singer. I don't know that she still has that deal, but she had a deal at the time, and her late husband, uh, Tim Boyle. Oh, this is so great that I got to mention him because his memorial is going to be Sunday. He just, oh, just recently passed away. The oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And uh, so we were doing demos or, yeah, demos for songs for her at Wally Hyder's, this renowned, oh, yeah. renowned studio mm. here in town. Uh, and Tim was on staff there. We hit it off. And, you know, I knew my way around. So when I got done with my bass bed, I, I'd help run the rest of the session with him. He helped me get my very first gig at Heiner's, which I started, strangely enough, as a tech. Uh, and, you know, people were dying by the vine because a woman named Jana Feliciano owned the studio at the time. She was Jose's uh, ex-wife. Oh. And when you're the, the, the spouse of a blind person, she was his producer, his publisher, his manager, she had power of attorney. She took him to the cleaners. And that studio w was doomed when she bought it. Uh, but it was a fantastic place uh, to work for. I was there about a year before I went under. But I made connections there. And I went, you know, left there on a Friday, started at Capitol Records on a Monday. Incredible. Worked there for 15 years, stopped there on a Friday. Where did you start on? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I went from Hyder to Sunset Sound. Oh, amazing. I worked for Sunset Sound for about a year. And I, like I said, I stopped. Who was, up, who was over then? There. Well, they had just purchased uh, a smaller studio on Selma called uh, Sound, the Sound Factory. Factory. Yep. 
and I really worked there most of the time. They unfortunately sold that a few years ago. Yeah, actually about, yeah, just the, yeah, about yeah, two was, years ago. Yeah. Uh, Love that room. Where we are right today, talking to you, uh, talking to your audience, we're at uh, Crossroads of the World, and we're right across the street from Sunset exactly, Sound. Yeah. It's that way. That way, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's still a fantastic facility. Probably my favorite place. Yeah. And uh, you know, I got to work with I got to work with Prince over there. I used to play basketball with Prince because there's a, outside the the three buildings where the studios <coughs> are. There's a little basketball court, and I know it's still there. Yeah, that same hoop. And I'm I'm probably fourteen, fifteen inches taller, or what was than he, but he could still dunk on me. <laughs> <laughs> he was great, great music. Oh, my, my God, one of the most unbelievably focused people I've ever been around in the studio. And what a great musician. Jeez. It was a golden period. When he was there, he did all of his biggest records. Yeah. And Craig told me he used to have a bed in Studio 3. Right. And there's still like a little bar area. Oh, really? You know, where he, you could, you know, make drinks and, and eat. And there was, a, I think at one stage, there was a refrigerator and everything. And, you know, what? Well, I remember, I must have sub, been subbing, but I was... I was there when he did 1999. He comes in at nine in the morning, kicks you out of the room for a few minutes, calls you back in. You better have those drums tuned up and mic'd up. Played the shit out of it, right? And then he started overdubbing. We start mixing by two o'clock, three o'clock. I'm running down the street to K Disc, mastered the thing back. So from 9 a.m. nothing to 5 p.m. mastered hit single. <laughs> Which song, 1999? 1999. That's how unbelievably focused that guy was. And, and I think that whole thing is like 17 tracks. I mean, everything. And you think today about how, you know, people, you know, have 40 guitar tracks and 20 this and 16 that. And, you know, just because he can focus and edit and, you know, you, you know what the finish line looks like. So after I, I was there for... Just a couple of years. No, uh, probably probably not the best time. It, well, they had just <laughs> they had just taken over the uh, sound factory that had been in receivership and had been locked up. Oh, and, incredible uh, to think. And the the air conditioning had blown up, and you know the 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 whole both buildings overheated, so both API consoles had blown up. We spent the first couple of months refurbishing those two consoles. That's so sad. I mean that. I mean. That room, of course, was Peter and Val's room, wasn't it? That L-shaped live room yeah. they made, like all of the Linda Ronstadt records in there and some of the best sounding. James Taylor. James Taylor, um, 70s records were made um, in that little L-shaped room. Yeah, a magic sounding room. And that board. Uh, I hear it's gone, yeah. Yeah, but it, it had a sound. I remember I did a rough mix. I was doing a record in there that I did a rough mix in like 10 minutes on that console. And then we did the, the real mixes at Ocean Way on a nice Neve. And it took, you know, it took like a couple of days mm -hmm. to get something that was close to the immediacy and the punch out of the 10 minute rough mix we did in there. I've had that same thing with APIs. Yeah. I used to have a 20 channel API. On all of my roughs, I bring them back on my SSL. It took me hours to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And I called Shelly and I told him the quandary. And Shelly's like, Goes, I know he would track on APIs and mix on SSLs. I was like, how do you do that? And he told me, oh, I just insert API line amps <laughs> in, in the, the SSL, yeah, especially right. on the low end to get that punchy tight yeah, low end. the transformer. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. But well, that's true. smart at me. Uh, that's one of the things, just as a very quick aside, one of the things that I like about some of the plugins that are, uh, are available to, to us now is these emulations of these consoles where you can take stuff that's mixed in the box and it just kind of doesn't have a lot of character, doesn't have a lot of punch, doesn't have, a, you know, depending on the kind of music. The UA stuff, I love. Steven Slate and Fabrice Gabriel, he has a company. Fabrice does all the, all the stuff for Slate. It's, you know, the FG, X, FG, this, it's, that's Fabrice Gabriel who does all the under the hood stuff. He has a company called Iosis that makes some 
spectacular stuff. We have naturally sort of moved into mastering here a little bit. How much... Well, let me just say this about the mastering. When I started at mm -hmm. Capitol Records, yep. if you were in the engineering program, if mm -hmm. they took you on and wanted you to learn the ropes, you started in mastering. Oh, that's very cool. Uh, Jeff Emmerich, you know, if you've run any of his stories with the Beatles, that's where they said it that was the EMI way. You learn what the finish line is supposed to look like. Good idea. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you, yeah. You, and you see firsthand a lot of the issues, especially back then when they were cutting vinyl, it was the, the primary delivery thing, right? That, you know, with things like sibilance and bass management and phase, all those things mm -hmm. were of paramount importance. Otherwise, you're going to blow up cutters. You're never going to be able to make records and Stars so forth. Stars jump out, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, nowadays with just digital, I mean, you can make a million mistakes or, you know, there's a, even just creatively, there's things you can do now that you, you couldn't back then. So anyway, that's, they wanted you to learn mastering to see what the end product could or should sound like. I've said so many times that I've learned most about mixing from my mastering engineer. Yeah, yeah. Because I'll say, well, you know, hey, it sounds great. What did you do? Oh, yeah. You had this weird kind of low bump. And to be honest, the last three songs I got from you have this weird low bump. And I'm like, oh, I wonder where it is. And I'm finding out what I'm boosting, where there's some frequencies yeah. crossing over, where there's some masking yeah. going on. Occasionally, I'll, I'll get, you know, like a repeat client's work and, you know, I call them up and say, uh, did you get new speakers? Yep. You know, because I never had, uh, th th this stuff sounds a little harsh, and I never would have said that about your stuff before. And it turned out that you did get new speakers and a subwoofer, and the subwoofer <coughs> wasn't like high pass to only get below 80 or 100 or whatever the number was. It was full range. So he had more, um... more fullness in the monitoring than he was actually putting in his mix. That makes sense, yeah. You know, so there's that type of thing that, that can go on. That's a whole other discussion, because I, I, I love subwoofers for testing, but I'll never mix through them. I just like- Well, in, in, in this room, because I have the speakers not, a, not only close to the wall, but almost, almost in the corners because of the dimensions of this room, that uh, Lord knows, I don't need subs. You know, it's very full. I, I heard it earlier. It sounded yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. We're, 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 we'll well, we'll get yeah, to we'll that portion as well. In a second. You have so much great history, though, so I don't want to lose uh -oh. any of it. So, uh -oh. okay, so where did you do sky skyscraper? Was that was that at Capitol? Uh huh. Which room? B. I've spent B. most of my life in B. Uh, a lot of great stuff in that room. What albums did you make in there? I mean, some of the earlier stuff. You know, Bob Seger, uh, Stray Cats, Steve Miller. Probably the high watermark for me was I got to work on a record with Miles Davis in that room. We did the Tutu record in that room. We have it, to pause for Miles Davis Tutu. That's yeah. insane. That record was a really important record for me. I had, through my father and classical music, his love of classical music and jazz only, I got into Miles Davis and John Coltrane and everything. And so for me, you know, discovering music as a little kid in the late 70s all the way through the 80s, this is why now I'm buying albums as they come out. You know, I'm buying You're Under Arrest, and I remember buying Tutu and then getting a pair of tickets for me and my friend John to go and see Miles play at Hammersmith Odeon. And I remember that tour. And I remember him, on the ticket it said, performance starts at 7.30. And I remember we arrived <laughs> at 7.31, and he's just, he was playing. Like, he started at 7.30. That's wild. He played for two and a half hours or something. He only time he turned around to the audience yeah, right. is when he would yeah. put up this huge card with the name of the soloist on it, and he would hold the soloist's name up for like three or four minutes while they were playing a solo at the front of the stage, so you knew who was playing, and then he'd go down and put it back down on the ground. How fantastic is oh, it was that? Amazing. Yeah, it was like no ego. Well, I saw him perform when I in you the, saw him perform in the studio so you've got me beat no but I got I, my little my little bit in <laughs> I, I saw when I was in college the uh bitches brew oh wow band play they with McLaughlin as well playing at that point yeah there was Keith Jarrett Chick Corea wow Ayurto on drums yep. and then I don't know I have half dozen years later in Boston I saw him uh, at Paul's Mall or one of the jazz joints there yeah and it was one of those where you know he didn't face the audience yep. at all, and he, you know, spitting on the floor, and he was in a bad period. Yep. Playing musically, it was phenomenal. Uh, and then I saw him one other time with 
that was the Jack Johnson era with Paul, uh, John McLaughlin and those mm -hmm. guys. That was amazing. But um, working with him, like I, uh, I, I was saying, uh, uh, Tommy LaPuma says, Tuesday we're going to do a date with Miles. And I go, Miles Standish? Miles Copeland? <laughs> you don't mean Miles Davis. Yeah, Miles Davis. Yeah, okay. Okay, then. I'd be a little terrified. Well, I was terrified. <laughs> and uh, it was going to be one day, right? And Marcus Miller, who I later got to work on a bunch of his stuff and some other great things, but it was the first time I got to work with Marcus, who was, had been playing in Miles' band. So they had a rapport, mm -hmm. right? And he had done the track that we were going to do. And I'd been told that they had started to record uh, at uh, Sound City. They didn't like the sound of the horn over there, so. You're in B again? I'm in B. Oh, okay. Yeah, like with any vocal session, right? You might set up five or six <coughs> very expensive microphones to capture, you know, the, the sexiest sound that they can make. And you'd say, don't don't sing too good, and just, I'm gonna hear a verse and a chorus in each of the, you know, and, and we're not gonna keep any of this shit, right? Yep, yep. So I did the same thing, you know, I had a, you know, a 47, a 251, a C12, uh, and an M M249. It's the different tube version of an M49. I got my head down at the console, and he's out there, and he immediately goes to the 249 and starts playing, and, you know, and, oh, I guess, I guess we've chosen the microphone because <laughs> mm -hmm. apparently Teo Nocero, that's the mic that that uh, Miles used on all those records that he did with him back in the day. So he already was married to that. And pff, what are you going to say? I mean, I mean, if, if you like that, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and it was great. It was fantastic. And in fact, like and I said, you probably knew how to work it. It was well, not, was not only that. Like I said, they they didn't like the sound they had gotten just shortly before when they were test driving uh, uh, Sound City, but the next day they came in, they loved the sound of the horn that they were getting there at Capitol. It's pretty darn important on a Miles Davis record. Yeah. <laughs> so, like I said, we were supposed to do one track, and this is back in the cassette era, and uh, I remember it well. Uh, Marcus said that he had another song on a cassette that he wanted Miles to take home and hear, and, you know, I'm working without a net here, so I made a cassette to cassette copy and I'm not policing it and I wasn't paying attention. So like eight songs got over on, on Miles' cassette copy to take home. He liked them all. So instead of one day, I got like 12, 16 days because I f***ed up his cassette. <laughs> Best mistake I ever made. Oh, incredible. And what yeah. an amazing album. Amazing album and Probably two thirds of that record was done in LA, and then they finished it up in New York with people like Michael Urbaniak and you know some great musicians and great studios and everything. And I just I would have expected being an East Coast guy that the the real shit you know the real would have been the the New York stuff. But it turned out I think the the test of time that the stuff we did in LA maybe it's because we did it first yeah was the more gritty more substantial stuff. Amazing. There were other tracks that we did, we had recorded him on that people had submitted, like Prince gave oh, us a track. I'm sure. But it was all like, it was all like uh, James Brown. Like there was all this huge horn thing. Mm -hmm. And all Miles did was, you know, put, put, we put a piano, in, Miles did a piano intro on this thing. We never used it. Well, it makes sense that him and Marcus would do it together because it has such a cohesive sound and that, that consistent writing from Marcus would have hold, held the whole thing together. And there's a, a book that I was just uh, uh, made aware of that Ben Sidron, the arranger, piano mm -hmm. player guy, who I got to work with once before, was a dream, working with uh, Steve Miller uh, on a record called Born to be Blue, where it was all these blues tunes. We did that at, in Studio B at Capitol so many moons ago too. But he's got a book coming out called The Last Waltz or something of Tommy LaPuma. It's all about Tommy LaPuma, the producer, mm -hmm who passed away a year or two ago. And, so sad uh, and gets to talk to him. And, and he, in this excerpt, talks about that record of the tutu. I'm thinking, man, this is so great because, you know, I was there, you know, yeah. that I got to, to witness that uh, extraordinary moment in time. What kind of hours did they work? 
love to know. Oh, that was a, a dream. We hardly, we, we didn't kill ourselves. In fact, the best parts of the record, I would go out to dinner with Miles and Tommy LaPuma and myself. Oh. Can you imagine the stories? I can't even imagine. No, you can't. You know, and Miles would talk about, you know, being in L.A. in the 40s. You know, there, there are these pockets where Lots, there was, probably. Where there was yeah. great jazz happening. Amazing. Yeah. Um, and you, you don't think of the West Coast jazz being in that kind of I've read a burning. few Miles biographies, and they're, they're absolutely incredible. The stories are insane. Yeah. And he was, he was hysterical. Like the first day he comes into the studio, and it's just Tommy and myself, and he comes in, he takes off his, he goes, I usually get a round of applause when I do this. And, and the Puma and I are going, is he serious? What? what? You know? Oh, man, he was so much fun. He'd come in for a playback and he'd give me his horn. He goes, keep this warm for me. I get to hold his horn while I do it. What a dream. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. Yeah. Oh, and he was, he was incredible. The depth of his work is yeah. insane. The fact that he's right there at the peak of bebop and he's all the way through yeah. every different genre comes yeah. in and out, free form, you name it. And when jazz and rock finally made sense together, yeah. he was part of all of that. And yeah. But harmonically, the way he heard, mm -hmm. I mean, you'd be playing, he'd be listening to something that he, you're asking him to go out and play to. And usually he would play, not surprisingly, I guess, with most free players, the best shit happened early you know not after multiple takes it's like you know you hit the button and out it comes right and he would play stuff you go how did you hear it play that it's mm -hmm. brilliant but i mean that isn't in those core you know what i'm saying it's like where, did, exactly where did that come from yeah amazing the, i think the people that we admire the musicians we admire like that just have a grasp of melody there's so many people wrapped up and talking about, you know, all the theory side. His sense of melody is insane. Every single solo I think he's ever played, I've, I've tried to figure out on guitar whenever <laughs> I've, it's just like, how do you think like him? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a lost cause, a, you know, he's totally one of a kind. Yeah, um, and I don't think it can be explained away by, you know, learning every mode and every position or whatever. I think yeah. it's just that ability to have you know, connection between his mind and his uh, instrument. Not to mention, I was thinking when you were talking about this, like we talked about two, two of the most important people in music, Frank Zappa briefly and Miles Davis. And both of those guys, as you were intimating with Steve Vai and, and with Miles and Marcus and stuff, every musician that's played with those two people has gone on. I mean, it's like, those are almost the yeah. two artists I think yeah. of that that's the sort of breeding ground for just insane yeah. amounts of talent. They contaminated a lot of great musicians. Yeah, Vinny, of course, Terry Bozio, you know, all of these There's incredible- another Chad Wackerman is another Chad one. Wackerman? Oh, it's just, yeah. Yeah, there's probably even more drummers, but- uh, Oh, insane. So after Tutu, was the phone ringing off the hook for, for, for jazz, uh, modern jazz kind of gigs? I, for a minute there, I had a run of trumpet players. I'm sure you did. I had uh, I got to work with a uh, wonderful player, Marlon Jordan, who's a New Orleans guy, and I got to work with Freddie Hubbard. Oh, incredible. I got to work with, uh, I did a couple of things with Wynton Marsalis. I was about to say, did you do any Wynton Marsalis? Some people would poo-poo him because the people who were, because he can do both the classical and the jazz. Oh, I'm a huge And player. lots of people say, well, you shouldn't be able to do both. No, no, no. Right? So the, the, the classical people hated him because he could do this, and the jazz people hated him because he could do that. And he did them both great. Oh, unbelievable. And yeah. it was his younger brother, Del Feo, who was a trombonist, who yeah. played with Art Blakey, and he produced most, if not all, of uh, uh, Winton's records. And we had a... And was the other, Bran uh, Branford, was he involved got, as well? I got to do one record with Branford that was... Amazing. That whole sort of period of like late eight, mid to late 80s and early 90s in, in jazz, uh, with exceptions, but most of that stuff was just so good. It was so good. It was such a great time for music. I loved it. You are very blessed to be working well, I, on those records. Well, not only that, being at Capitol, you know, a yep. lot of people came there like uh, to work on that Natalie Cole Unforgettable record. Amazing. You know, for, for people who don't know some of the backstory there, there were all these three-track analog masters of her dad, 
And the beauty of it being three track meant that, you know, there, there was stereo orchestra and then an isolated vocal track. So we could mix and match, which wow. is what, you know, it's duet, duets with her, her dad, who obviously had been deceased a while. And it was a beautiful thing. And I, the challenge technically for the arrangers and for the engineering was that whenever Nat was singing, there was bleed. Uh, so you had to play the same notes as they played underneath when Nat was singing. So, you know, the, a lot of it was the road mapping, figure out what was, who was going to sing what, and then you could do whatever you'd like unless it, Nat was singing, and then you had to play, you had to write well, what they were, you know, what's going on underneath him and those, those lines. Man, that was, that was a lot of fun. Again, Al Schmidt, uh, who's one of the, the greatest people who ever did what, or do what we do. You know, he's got a, he's the only guy who's an engineer with a star on the Walk of Fame, 23 Grammys. But he's he's still a regular. I mean, the guys, we won't mention how old he is now, but <coughs> he's still swinging for the fences and working a lot still, and it still makes Capitol Records his home, the Capitol Studios. I remember working on a record a few months ago, and they, I got the, the parking spot at the front, and the highlight of my life was, and Eric was with me, remember? We pulled up and we, they had, we had a sign, we had a sign parking spaces and it was Al Schmidt and you got, you got next to him, Eric Gonzalez and Warren Hewitt <laughs> like that. And I was like, take a photo, did you did take a photograph of you, didn't you? I was like, take a photograph of that in front of Capitol Records, you're parked next to Al Schmidt. Man, yeah. that's bucket list time right there. Just as a quick aside, we are so lucky to have such a big tribe of great people in the audio community here in LA. Mm -hmm. You know, nowadays a lot of people make records by, I, I don't know if committee is the right word, but you know, where you send files to people hither, thither, and yon, and they're not all playing together at the same sure. time. That's not only, I mean, some, some music can be done tremendously successfully that way. Absolutely. Some, some not so much, but the bigger loss, I think, is the, the lack of contact with your, your, your people, your, your, your comrades, your we, friends. We talk about it all the time. One of the great things about the Produce Like a Pro community is there's a lot of collaboration. And that's something we encourage all the time because I feel like that's the only way we're ever going to grow. It's like if you're doing something, I'm like, how did you do that? And you're like, oh, it's cool, but how did you do that? And right. you, you grow so much quicker when you have somebody to bounce ideas off. Even if it's just two people, but like you're intimating, having a band in a room, having an artist working with a band is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah. And that, I think, is music that's difficult to replicate, you know, trying right. to have a jazz quartet that's sent to four different musicians. Yeah, even if it's not jazz, even if it's a pop record, you know, yeah. somebody will phrase one little thing sure. this way and then the guy will echo it or the singer. Or, I agree, yeah. And you you have something that, you know, the sum is greater than the individual parts kind of thing, which you couldn't do or probably wouldn't happen yep. if it was all a la carte. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it because uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of discussion. I get it, people discussing about the limitation of tracks. And I actually don't get too hung up on that because I feel like um, – you know, there's, we have a lot of discussions about, oh, people have 192 tracks now and they only used to have like 16 or four. And I, you can get into that world, but then I point out things like, yeah, you know, bands like Queen, who I'm a huge fan, of course, had like 16 vocals on one on the left and 16 vocals on the right. And in a defense of a kid making a record now, they don't need to bounce them, so they can just have 16 bus to one fader, right. 16 bus to one fader. So I don't get hung up on, on the track count as much as what we're talking about, which is working in isolation, which can be fun. Don't get me wrong. Sure. I love sometimes spending five hours trying to figure out a simple guitar part that's going to yeah, work. And really you don't well. have people like, you Come know. on, Warren, we've been here four <laughs> hours and you still haven't got a good part. So there is a beauty in that as well. Surely. Um, and there's so many of the people we admire that have come up with it. But, but you know, if there's one thing, one takeaway from, from this little piece of the conversation, yeah, I agree. Collaboration is where you grow so much. And also... We're, we're lucky to be in a, a hub like this because there's a, a tribe. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a big, uh, you've been to my lunch. I, I throw a weekly, I call it the uh, LA Audio Lunch Bunch. And we've been doing it for years. And it's, it's not just engineers and producers, but people who are all allied to the, 
the, the, the music industry. If you say where it is, you're going to have to get the venue to be no, about no, 10 times the no, size. No, I'm not going to say where it is. <laughs> That's what I mean. It's in sunny Southern California. <laughs> Speaking of which, though, friends have just started one, their own branch, in Nashville. Wonderful. And they got another one starting up, just started up in Memphis. That's amazing. Uh, our friend Fab DuPont is trying to get one going in New York. And now I need to find a, a, a cadre of a like-minded audio folks in the mountain time zone. Two weeks ago, the, uh, the guys in Nashville FaceTimed us because they're two hours ahead. So they, oh, were, they were just winding down their lunch as we were starting ours and you know, passed the phone around. And it was hysterical as I saw in, on the phone in Nashville, several people, a handful of people who were at our lunch two weeks before you know, when they were in town for the end of the Grammys. Well, we're going to be in Nashville in May for, for Summer Nam, so we'll make sure we go to it. Uh, I've never been, but I think I might have to go this year. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful place to go and hang out with musicians and producers and engineers almost exclusively. I think my best way of describing it is the first time I ever went. I, we walked into the hall, and the first thing we saw on the first like row was the tape op booth. And standing at the tape op booth was the owner or one of the owners of the company, Mr. Larry Cr Crane, was just standing there. And I walked up and Reed Shippen was there and Ryan Hewitt. And I just kind of went, hey, how's everybody? I'm like, where else in the world, apart from one of your lunches, is that going to happen? <laughs> you know, because you go to the Winter Nam and it's so spread out. It's so unbelievably massive. And yes, all the, all the same people are there, but not. Right. This is a, it's, Summer Nam is a great place to go and hang and interact with incredible people. When I was at Capitol in yep. 91, and we did Sinatra Duets 1, and then the 2, I think, was the following year. But frankly, we would record in the Punditon. We had recorded mm -hmm. enough for both records in the first set of sessions. You knew it was going to be great in that, okay, you got Phil Ramon, you know, driving the bus, and Al Schmidt recording it. You know, you're off to a great running start. But what was so political about it, this record was the first that Sinatra had done for EMI in years, because he started off on Capitol back you know, in the 50s and 60s. He famously had a, a top floor, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, and then, then he jumped to Repri uh, Warner Brothers and they made that label for him, Reprise or Reprise or whatever. And so he was over there for a number of years, and this was the first of the triumphant return to EMI, right? So marketing whiz of the time, like I say, this is 91. They were going to pair him up and do all these duets with people who were selling records at the time. Contemporaries. Yes. yes. You know, people like Bono and, you know, <laughs> yeah. all this crazy stuff. Some of which was, was really genius, but when we were doing the recordings, we had... Frank and we had the band. We they didn't know not only who was the duet person, but they didn't know what lines. It's like if we didn't get a great line off of Frank, eh, I guess we were gonna get you know the, the duet artist to do that line. But we had set up um, a giant booth in the midst of the orchestra. Right, this is a capital where the the wall we could open the wall, and we had strings in one room one big room, Studio B, and then in, in Studio A, we had rhythm and horns. And in the midst of that room, Incredible. We, had we had arranged to have built, like, effectively, you know, big gobos that we could make, and a floor, and a roof, that we could make a hut to put him in with glass all around it. Uh, so we could mix and match takes, because we knew there wasn't going to be any click. So they hired, Phil decided he was going to hire... Uh, Frank's rhythm section, his live rhythm section, which was Chuck Berg offer on bass, not too shabby. Greg Fields on drums. Phil figured that these guys will know where the tempos are so we could mix and match takes. Right. If we had them isolated enough. So that was the reason behind the hut. So the spot. So the, the first night, and Pat Williams is doing all the arrangements. So we're off to a great start, right? So the first night, uh, we spent the afternoon had spent the afternoon with the band getting you know, the sounds on the band and, you know, the head, all the nuts and bolts, the headphones. And then Frank comes down the, the hall with his entourage and he walks into the, the studio with all the players and everything all ready to go. And he goes, 
the hell am I doing here? I've done all these before. And turned around and, and leaves. This is how we're starting the sessions. Wow. Oops. No pressure or anything. So Phil goes out and then tries to, you know, like, well, yeah, you've, of course you've done all these before, but this isn't how we're doing it. Remember, we're doing this now for EMI. Mm -hmm. This is your triumphant return back to EMI. And, you know, you, you, you sort of bought it, but you know. So he goes. So we're not sending the band home, so we record takes. And it was spectacular, right? So the next afternoon, we did get him to come back. We put him in the booth. We figure out which of the, you know, five or six $20,000 microphones he's going to sound best on. And, okay, is it the, am I using the single-sided phones or am I using the doubles? And am, am I using the printed music or am I using the teleprompter? And if I'm using the teleprompter, is it white on black or black on white? You know, so we turn over all these rocks in order to get him. So we sort all that out, figure out what my and start overdubbing on the stuff we had done the night before. Uh, just kind of laying there. I mean, he's, he's just trying to tell us, like, this ain't my thing. I, I, I'm not going to overdub this. You know, this is, no. He likes doing it live. Right. So, 7 o'clock, you know, we've been, been working for a couple hours with him, and we're, all, we're sort of ready for the night sessions where the, where the guys come down. So here, here comes the band. And now Frank says, like I said, after we figured out what mic and the phones and the teleprompter or the music, well, I can't be in here. I got to be out there with the fellas. So what we ended up using is a handheld wireless SM87 and wedges on the floor next to the piano player. That's how we did the record. Instead of the $10,000 hut with the, you know, <laughs> all the variables so we could have control. That's how it ended up. And That's as, amazing. I, but it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Well, it's a lot more live. The interaction uh, yeah. that he's so used to from playing live yeah, shows. Know, like we were talking about earlier, yeah. the, the energy mm -hmm. you get from, from one another uh, by it all you know, being live right now, and there's no going back. And that feeling it. Through yeah. the music hitting you, the physical yeah. thing. Yeah, it was, it the was interaction, great. look, catching somebody by the eye, and uh, yeah. all of these. Tom Scott played a sax solo in the band on whatever the, the arrangement was, and it was just unbelievable. I'm getting goosebumps just remembering. I remember at, at the end of the take, like the whole band stood up and gave him a big round of applause. So, of course, Kenny G. They replaced him with Kenny G. Because Kenny's going to sell some records. Tom Scott ain't going to sell the records like Kenny G's going to sell the records. So there was shit like that happening. And there was a lot of other political stuff, like I said, about... I'd love to hear that take. It's funny because oh, I, I have the same experience with Aerosmith. Tom played a solo in a song. And when we finished the song, he's like, oh, do you want me to do some overdubs? And we're all looking at each other like, who's going to ever play mm -hmm. a sax solo better than the one you just did live? Right. Yeah. 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 Well, no, he's unbelievable. And a really easy guy to work with. Oh, yeah. It's a dream. Yeah. So if you ever hire him, and he's remarkably affordable these days, if you hire him, <laughs> he'll bring in all the best players. He'll chart everything out. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. He's tremendous. Amazing. One of the fun things was, uh, we, you know, he was he was 77 or something, which doesn't sound that old to me now. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, he was kind of uh, starting to lose it a little bit. and. Uh, I mean, not vocally so much as just being a little foggy, shall we say. But he always had the carton of carton of camels and the big thing of Tootsie Roll Pops. Oh, and Jack Daniels. Those were the three accoutrements were always table side for, for Frank singing. Phil talks about that in his book Making Records. He just talked about how like everything how it had to be everything had to be just so for the artist and how important that was. Absolutely. The first gut things are typically the most true the most the one's going to resonate with the listener and be the best and especially now we have technology we have there's a, if there's a little booger on a note you can fix but the immediacy of those early things right which is why for example i'm going to make a tangent here about one of my pet peeves in the studio is those self mixers for headphones for people but most people can't mix you know i go out and say look this is the mix from the control room that's all you need you know, believe me, this is all you need. But if you if you think you need a little bit more of yourself, this is more of you. You know, and the, these other things they say, drums or strings, you don't need any of that, right? 
eight minutes later, I can't hear myself. And you go out and they got every fader on 12. It's like, I hate those things. And like when you hear people singing sharp, it's typically they've got too much of themselves mm -hmm. in the phone. You pull them back a little bit, push a little of the pitch, the piano or something, and then suddenly that problem goes away. They're, they're singing flat. It usually means they've got a little too little of themselves. So you can police the performance and get it right early on if you recognize that type of thing. So anyway, that's one of my pet peeves about <laughs> because people don't know how to mix. Come on. But the Sinatra thing was a real eye-opener. Oh, here, here's another one. Like I say, um, they didn't know who the duet artist was, and we didn't do the duets. Almost all of them were done. By the, the artist in their own suit. Yeah. Or? One of the ones that jumps to mind was I've Got a Crush on You, which was with Barbara Streisand. Amazing. And when she did her bit, she sings, I've got a crush on you, Francis, to, you know, espouse the illusion that they're standing next to one another, and she's singing to them, right? So, so Phil and some other people from the from Capitol went out to uh, Sinatra's place in the in the, the desert out in Palm Springs with a little handheld recorder. And they, Frank, it would be great if you sang, you know, I've got a crush on you, Barbara. No, I'm not singing Barbara. Thank you. And they took him saying Barbara, pitched it and stretched it and <laughs> flew it in. That's what's on the record. <laughs> But in, in 91, that, was, uh, that wasn't as easy to do as it is now. It says, Tom Dowd, Andy Johns, Eddie's manager, solo in the wrong key slash cassette. So yeah. <laughs> well, that was a, a whole bunch of s*** there. No, but, I love all that. But the very first record I got to work on as an assistant at Wally Hyder's when I first blew into town was an Eddie Money record. It was the No Control record. And Eddie had just passed away this last year. I mean, yeah. What, yeah. Nine months ago or Very so. Very recent. So not unlike the Miles Davis thing, well, I come from Boston. Tom Dowd, producing the record, had produced, you know, a bunch of great re records and a lot of different styles of music, including John Coltrane. He only produced two Coltrane records, but they were Giant Steps and A Love Supreme. Arguably, you know, if you're a jazz fan. Um, unbelievable choices. <laughs> ar arguably, the, maybe the two biggest records in jazz, period. Yeah, you know, we know plenty of people would argue with that, but certainly... Yeah, you can throw in Kind of Blue, Blue Train. Pantheon of great No, they're right up there in top 10. Yeah. Yeah. They've influenced so many yeah. people. At any rate, so yeah. getting to, to talk to, to Tom uh, on, the, on the breaks about, you know, all these things. You know, just Like with, with the Coltrane thing, he'd say, well, you know, Coltrane would say, like, man, I, I played this, but I wish I'd played it over there. And, uh, and he said, we did a lot of editing on Coltrane. What? I know people would slit their throats if they heard you say this, right? Because they were practicing all these solos as if they came from Mount Sinai, you know, like from the mouth of God. That, that this is how, but but no, it's putty. Same thing that that was how Miles thought of the music. He said, "Do whatever you want," because he trusted you that you'd make it better. I mean, he, he gives you all this raw material, uh, and that was the same thing with 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 Tom's story about uh, working with Coltrane. Is that you know, you you. you once you had a rapport and you understood that <coughs> you were going to make it better, let's go. And, of course, back 50s and early 60s when uh, Tom was working on those uh, Coltrane records, it was all two-track tape. It was you, a case of taking, like, seven-minute solos and editing them down to, like, yeah. a minute and a half of yeah. like, what they agreed was Distilling the Distilling the most important, right. the most wonderful things, right? Just making it better. Yeah. Not like the chafe. Yeah. It's yeah. just making it better. One of the things uh, you, people might not understand nowadays about editing, right? Uh, because if you're editing on a workstation, it's just highlight, you know, command X, command Y, you know, all that stuff. Back then, you're cutting tape. And to have seamless edits, you can't do a crossfade like you can in your workstation. You'd have to do it with the angle of the cut, the physical cut with the razor blade. So uh, there was a company called Edit All that made a block that had a couple different angles that would get you through the majority of the thing. But Tom said all those edits were done with scissors. <laughs> and, and at Capitol, when I started there, there was a, a big magnetic box with a hole that you'd put your scissors in to demag the scissors, so you didn't you didn't put clicks on the tape when you started editing tape. Yep. But 
I said, well, how the hell did you make sure that the, um, the edit, the, the, you know, when you made cuts, I mean, the, the angle was the same. He said, you turn your hand over as far as your wrist would go, and that was your angle. Because that, that's the same every time. <laughs> oh. It's fascinating. But he, he, and he always told me about, about where to do the edits. Like, you wouldn't do it like on the downbeat. You do it like on the hi-hat before, you know, like a 16th before the thing. Because everybody's looking for the edit there. Your ear is looking, expecting it to be, you know, the downbeat of the next section or whatever. So you always have to disguise it by doing it a little off from where people are going to be looking for it. And, and your ear is not going to detect it. A lot of good stuff like that. An amazing opportunity for the, for the first record I, I got to work on when I came to town. And, you know, Andy Johns was amazing. But um, Tom's Out was by far the most amazing producer. Not only did he, uh, you know, design a bunch of stuff on the Ampex 24 track, but musically. Okay, like this is this is back in the era when people would be in the studio for months. They'd write the songs in the studio, you know. And you're it's not like they've come after pre-production and they come in and they blow it down three or four times and you've got the take. You know, you could be slogging away for a long time. Tempers would rise when people would, you know, these guys finally got their shit together and this guy keeps fucking up. So I remember Tom Dowd would do things like he'd go to the bass player and say, "Man, I fucked up. I gave you the wrong part and show you." He never gave me, but it, it, he he took all Diffused the heat the, him to say yeah. himself off yeah. of the players, and then suddenly the next take or maybe the two takes that would be the one because he knew. I'm look; these guys are uptight. I'm going to take care of this. Mm -hmm. He was the most observant of not just music, but of people that I've ever seen. And speaking of, of music, I remember we were doing rough mixes on this record in another studio because the studio we had been working on uh, wasn't wasn't available for this, and it had a nice Neve console in there. But he hated the speakers. I think they were Yuri Timelines or whatever. Something he hated. So mm -hmm. he always had a notebook, like a loose leaf binder, with with all the takes, you know, with the charts and the lyrics, and minutes and seconds above the bars, so he know. From looking at the tape counter where he was in the song right hated the speakers gonna do rough mixes okay we're rolling in quarter inch tape go to record Peter. okay turns the speakers off you know can tell where he is in the song and it's not just a static mix he's got you know echo bombs and big fade cross fades you know the guitar solo ride you know all this shit going on okay roll, let's play it back turns on the speakers I mean, just to prove a point, I hate these things. They're working against me. I don't need them. Get them out of the picture. I'm not going to hear it. I, uh, but I know where I'm at in the music, and I know where I'm at. I mean, how power? You know, how, how powerful was that? It's insane. So, what, what's he referencing? Time code? Where would he? You know, the minutes and second counter off the uh, off the off, off the tape machine. Okay, we just get a remote the tape remote. Yeah. The uh, MM 1200 had a little remote thing, so you could park it on the meter bridge or. You put it right on the on your your charts, so you know right where he was musically by the tape counter. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, but I mean it's just like you know we find all these excuses. Oh, I can't do that. I hated the screw it. If it if you don't like it, get it out of the picture. Incredible, amazing man. There was a, a DVD, uh, the, this language of music. Have you ever mm -hmm. seen that? Yeah, that's amazing for your viewers who have it. You you must go look this up because not only. Was he responsible for all, you know, all the Aretha Franklin records, the, um, the jazz stuff, you know, Ornette Coleman and Eric Dolphy and uh, John Coltrane and all that stuff. But, you know, all the great R&B stuff that Atlantic Records did, you know, and then Cream. Derek um, and the Dominoes. Yeah, Derek and the Dominoes and I, the Rascals. I mean, yeah. like, just an amazing cross-section of stuff this guy did. But... He worked on the Manhattan Project. His thing before music was physics. Hello? <laughs> yeah, you know, they're totally unique and amazing, amazing guy. Just an amazing guy. Andy Johns, too, was quite amazing. <laughs> and I remember him in the, on that record, he would get in, into these jags where he was bemoaning, you know, his Glenn, rather, his, his, el his elder brother, right? 
I believe so, yes. Yeah. yeah older brother, yeah. That, who's a renowned engineer and famous producer himself, you know, how he always mistreated him and stuff like that. It's like, you know, man, no matter how big you are, everybody's, you know, got, got some brother. baggage. Everybody's got some baggage. <laughs> Uh, that, that there were some really uh, amazing times, but uh, but like I said, the, this was the era where people were in the studio for months. Well, how did Andy work in the studio? What was his kind of process? Well, we were working at Hyder's. The room we were in, uh, Studio B, strangely enough, is a room that's seventy-five by fifty by thirty-five. Wow! Hello, I mean, you could do orchestras in there, right? True. Yeah. And the way they did. The smaller size ensemble was, you know, they had curtains so you could cordon it off and, you know, quite often you'd have like a big lounge area in the back with ping pong or something where you did the recording in, the, in a cordoned off smaller section of the room. Man, he got some great sounds. British guys really had a, a sense of how to make the room pop, you know, compressing like the room uh, in a way that uh, I hadn't seen well, like I say, this is pretty early on for me, so I, I hadn't seen anybody like get this excitement just out of the basic track. That was mind blowing. And the consoles, both studios A and B had one of a kind Neve consoles called like A230. And they had the mic prees that I've never seen anywhere else. Huge, I mean, it was like, I don't know, 56 in and an offline monitor. They, were, they took up a lot of real estate, they were big. Great sound, and anyway, it was eye-opening. You know, I never heard anybody get anything like that. Andy was really, and again, Tom Dowd uh, let Andy, you know, Tom obviously is an accomplished engineer on his own. Absolutely. But uh, he definitely uh, was more than appreciative of what Andy was doing with this stuff. What an incredible, uh, you know, you get to work with Andy and Tom Dowd. Yeah. Insanely good. Oh, yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Parrot. One of the drummers, Gary Malabar, you know that guy? Because he's still doing great records. I worked with him later with Steve Miller, and I just heard his name the other day. He's, he's still swinging for the fences, that cat. Marty Walsh was the guitar player that I remember for that record, and he's still doing great records. I think he's on the staff up at Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Fantastic. Yeah. The little note about the cassette, I remember we had taken a break, I guess, and... They made a cassette of this one song for Eddie Money to learn to play a harmonica solo. And you know, when he came, came in to do it, he had learned it in the wrong key because the cassette was playing off speed. <laughs> you know, well, that was pretty funny. It was like, you don't have that shit happen today normally unless somebody plays like a 48K session at 44.1 and don't notice it. I've seen that happen. I've seen that happen myself many times. Yep. I remember one time I had, uh, after Capital, I went to work for Sony Pictures and I did a lot of movie scoring and occasionally records would come in to use the big room to do an orchestra overdub. And you know how when you, you, you turn on the Mac computer, it plays a little, blah, little fanfare. The Susumi? Yeah. And uh, I said, oh, that, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's a little flat or something. Well, the arranger comes in after we got the, the tracks up and got the headphones all straight and he goes, uh, guys, that's the wrong key. Because Mr. Pitch Perfect over here didn't notice that <laughs> right. it was a 48 session playing at 44.1. So, uh -huh. oops. 10% well, different speed is quite a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty more, uh, uh, yeah. Yep. I've had that happen many, many times. Yeah. yeah. It is one of the problems with uh, uh, sometimes I get files sent to me that don't have the... the like dot wave on the end or dot AIF or something. So you don't really know what it is and you guess. And sometimes the workstation will also guess and guess the wrong speed. One of the worst things I've seen, and it's happened in a session I was working on many, many years ago was when you have your a clock and you set the clock to say 44.1, but inside of the session, session, it's set to 48. Right. And the only way to replicate, you have to undo it, go work backwards yeah. through it, but yeah. yeah. A real yeah. pain. Yeah, that's a noobs. Yeah. Yeah. I've had I've had that happen too. And you don't discover it till after you've done the master, then you have to you really have to start over. There's a Miles Davis note here. We went through a lot of this. You were talking about the jazz scene in the forties, he was talking about that. And then you got percussion overdubs exclamation mark. Oh dear. 
So we're going to do percussion overdubs on the record, and Marcus and, and Tommy LaPuma and myself, we were all voting for Paulinho da Costa, who is one of the greatest, is a Brazilian percussionist, done a million records. To me, the standout resume item for Paulinho was Billie Jean, the Michael Jackson tune. Fantastic. Right? Yeah. So he's playing the Afuche. But the way they rec they recorded it mm -hmm. at half speed. So when you play it up at full speed, it has this sheen, this overtone. Ah, makes right? sense. Talking of speed. Yeah. yeah. So, but the funny thing is, as you know, it's hard to play at a slow tempo and have it feel not like a dirge, you know, like because I mean, it's 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 you're in the mud, right? Yes, a mentor I mean, of mine told me you won't be able to play less than 60 until you're over 40. <laughs> That's great. The fact that he could do that and have it swing and have it just, not only just glue, but the, put this lilt in the track. That's so great. So that's Polino. So we wanted him. Miles thought he wanted to get the guy who played in, at that point in his live band. I won't name names because the guy is not only a great human being, but he's a great musician, right? But the guy shows up, and there's like 30 freaking road cases. It's like Barnum and Bailey came to town. 30 road cases full of stuff. Have you ever done a percussion overdub? You know, you don't really know what the guy's going to need, so he brings a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of toys, and sometimes it'll be, you know, kungas and tamales and all sorts of larger stuff. But this was a tremendous assortment of stuff. He gets it all set up, and now Miles is figuring out Maybe this wasn't the smartest move, but is, is he going to, like, admit that he made a mistake? No. <laughs> He's going to fuck with this guy, right? So he gets on the talk back. I get, you know, whatever, the first song up. And he gets on the talk back and he goes, man, whenever you hear something to play, don't play. And he lets go of the talk back. <laughs> what? Okay, this is going to be interesting. Go and record and, you know, the guy's out there and. Picks up the cowbell, remembers what Miles says, puts the cowbell down. Another 32 bars go by. Picks up something else, remembers what Miles said, put it down. You know, this, this is how we go through the whole track. The guy gets an idea and then thinks better of it and puts it down. And we're like dying. We're dying in the control room. You know, and Miles, <laughs> you know, this is all Miles. His handiwork because yeah. he's set this thing up. Because he's not going to admit that, you know, we should have gotten Polina. What did you end up getting? One hit once in one song. And that's all we use from this, this overdub from this guy. And Polina did everything else. Oh, so you did get, you, you did get your oh, guy yeah. afterwards. Yeah, no, yeah. no. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, with, with, like Whenever I say, you think of something to play, don't, don't play. play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, that's how he engineered his way out of a, an embarrassing situation. He just made it just be a complete farce, and it was hysterical. And like I say, to his, to his very great credit, he's a great musician. I won't mention his name, but if I did, you'd say, oh, man, that guy's great. And you'd be right. He is great. But it was just hysterical the way he got set up by Miles. Leonard Skillard mixing the Tom Dowd version of Street Survivors. And then you've got Barry Rudolph with an exclamation. Do you know who he is, right? Of course, I know Barry very well, yeah. Yeah, I worked for Universal Music from 2003 to 2015. And somewhere in the middle of there, there was Guitar Hero and Rock Band, right? And, very well. And I mixed a whole bunch of those things for the game. So I would get the original multi-tracks. And a lot of times I would go to LAFX studios here in town. The Vicaris. Dan and Ann are my dearest friends. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, that's Tommy Vicari's brother. Right. And the two of them just did an amazing job on the Oscars. They do all the, the music for the show. Well, you know, record the orchestra for the show. So I was there actually doing another thing. I was mixing, as you just read, I was mixing some, like, there was a version of, I forget which Leonard Skinner record, that was done soup to nuts by Tom by Tom Dodd, and then the band played it for Al Cooper, who I think maybe had produced an earlier record or something. Al convinces them that it's it's not happening, and that he redid everything. And what's amazing about that band, because I was familiar with the one that had been released, the solos are almost note for note. The dueling guitar solos, I mean, these guys were really something. But the Tom Dowd stuff, not only musically was it 
really similar and, and, and good. It was just, it had never seen the light of day. So this was, you know, an attempt to, to, to release it, to, you know, make some money off of the catalog stuff. So we were mixing it. So I'm mixing it at LAFX and Barry Rudolph comes in. <laughs> His name's on the box. He recorded this. He just happened to walk in. I mean, that's pretty funny. And he told, told the backstory of, you know, working for Tom. I, think, I don't know if they did this at Criteria. I think they did this in Florida. And then when they did the record with Al Cooper, they did it in Muscle Shoals, maybe, or somewhere else. But, uh, but yeah, I just think, you know, this is another thing, talking about being in a hub of recording like we are here in Los Angeles. There are all sorts of interweaving things happen, Right. Like the guy walks in who recorded this thing 20 years ago and has all this, all this story about it. It was fascinating. Amazing. But they had, there was another guy involved with that who Universal had hired and he was some like big expert on all things Leonard Skinner, right? And he told a story about how, which is not surprising, we wouldn't work for any of these big record companies. Artists would make their record, mix the record, go off on tour to promote the record, and forget about the masters. I mean, the mixes obviously got taken in and you know made into vinyl and blah blah blah. But the multi tracks could be left behind for years before somebody said, "Hey, our guys." And you know, so that that was true with all sorts of artists I used to work with, Bob Seger, and we had to go through all sorts of hoops to try and find these old masters. You go into studios even today that have um, tape vaults. And you just look at all these oh, hundreds of reels yeah, of 24 tracks. Yeah, and I'm sure it's the same thing with hard drives. Mm -hmm. People, you know, make a safety copy and leave it behind. So, yeah, I think of a few records. I oh, probably, yeah. I don't have the only copy, but I have copies of the, of the records. I've sure. Made, yeah. What is this rather lovely framed article here? This looks well for incredibly enticing. From where I, from where I sit, this was like my high water mark back in. Uh, God, I think it was 1986 already uh, that uh, I got a chance to work on the Miles Davis 2-2 record. And at the time, he was constantly drawing. We had these capital memo pads by the phone, and he'd always be sketching and whatnot. And one day, I, at the end of the session, I discovered that he had drawn one of me. This is Miles' signature. This is me running around like a chicken with my head cut off during the session. And this is him. Believe it or not, he had red hair at that point. He had red hair. Yeah, nice. It was, it was kind of burgundy, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And this is him saying, F*** you, shut up, which is something he probably had occasion to say to more people <laughs> than just me. But as I say, I just thought this was like refrigerator art or something cool because he was always sketching. And my wife at the time said, uh, hello, some guy has one-man shows at the Guggenheim. This is spectacular that you have these. So we had him. You know, the uh, preservation mat, the ink, you know, acid-free mat, and, you know, the archival thing, and it's just Absolutely a, a treasure. Yeah. Wow, what an incredible It was incredible a great thing. memory of, of the dates. But in addition to the memories, I have this to be thankful that I have. That's it's absolutely just incredible. really great. So let's do some gear talk. Let's start with, the, I suppose, the center section of your console here. Yeah, I have a... Manly, as in Manly Labs, our dear friend of Anna Manley, she made five or six of We love Anna, yep. And so this is a, the, the master kind of switcher, where I have a number of monitor sources and a couple of different speaker options. The flow that would be if I was not working in the box, but actually working with the analog processing. Yep. I would have the ability to wake up this and play my source yep. off of this incarnation of Soundblade, which is a... Sonic Studios uh, workstation. So play it through there. And then my converter of choices, most often the uh, Prism. Uh, I do have a couple of other options, which I, I don't have plugged up at the moment. So, And then out of that, it comes to this. This is like my analog monitor thing that also has a few, three different inserts where I can audition three different types of analog processing. Yep. Um, and I have a little patch bay down here so I can either insert stuff in series down there, or I can do them up here and audition them individually. And this thing also has MS, where MS, for those who don't know, if, if you have stereo and just have two channels, 
the stuff that is common to both channels appears in the center. We call that phantom center. And the stuff that is not common out on the sides, we call that, strangely enough, the sides. <laughs> so the matrix in this thing will allow you to make, if I'm in MS mode, this is no longer the left, it is now the center. And this was no longer the right, it is both sides. So if, if I'm addressing a problem where, say, the voice is sibilant, mm -hmm. but yet the symbols are on the verge of already being harsh mm -hmm. on the sides, you don't want to add EQ in stereo mode to brighten up the voice because you're going to exacerbate the harshness of the symbols out on the sides. So if you put yourself in MS mode, now I can address the center separately from the sides. I can brighten this up without making these worse. Do you find you're doing that often or is that? I do. Oh, you do? Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily for EQ, but sometimes for uh, for compression, like yep. where I want to like either punch up the middle and not make the sides more aggressive, I, uh, or you want to bring detail up from the sides and more s sense of space. You know, you can uh, upward expansion from the sides and leave the, the middle alone and not mess with the, the balance of the the stuff in the center, like maybe the bass and the voice, uh, you can do it. it. It's a very, very handy thing. You don't, you don't have to go overboard with it. I must admit, though, when I, when I first got this piece, which is a Rupert Neve Master Bus Processor, and it, mm -hmm. among other things, it does have a fantastic MS capability, where you can have the compressors just doing the the sides or just the front or or being linked or not. Yep. And another thing that it does. Um, as a character thing is that the transformers, you know, iron gives us meat and potatoes on the sound, <laughs> especially if necessary when so many things are mixed in the box that may or may not have, you know, a real character that, especially for pop or rock music, uh, you may really want to, to be in the ballpark of other things that are in the marketplace that are in that style of music. So this thing has two different kinds of, of windings on the transformers. You can either have it just a, a straight ahead transparent path, or you can have two different flavors of color, two different uh, windings on the transformers that gives you uh, the, the blue. The blue gives us more meat and the red gives us more of a silky top. And again, the, the more you get the stuff to, to have a, a musical character on the way in, the less stuff you have to do with uh, EQ. EQ causes phase shift and makes stuff perhaps a little more blurry than it was until you reach for the equalizer. So it's better to, to reach for stuff on, on the way in to, uh, to achieve what you want without having to put other kind of band-aids, if you will, on it. I have another A to D converter, which I don't have plugged up at the moment. It's a uh, Bricasti. Okay. And a Bricasti, you may or may not know from, they make a, a spectacular convolution uh, reverb. And their converter, that's a D to A converter, has these filter sets on it that make digital sources sound unbelievably beautiful. And there's, there's a handful of them. So again, you can make this, the, just the conversion be so revealing and so much more musical than just playing it back through maybe you know, something else. I don't want to name anything else, but you know what I'm saying? It's, yeah, absolutely. It's, the, it's a different color. It's a different uh, arsenal in your toolkit that'll give you a running start to something beautiful and musical and wonderful without having to do much of anything else. Is there a sort of a hierarchy? So I see that, so these are your converters. Right. And then this is obviously how you're selecting input source. Right. Monitor volume, obviously VUs for visual cues <laughs> as well. Are you usually going here directly after that then? That's like the first thing you're... Uh, the way uh, most most stuff works for me is to do any dynamic processing mm -hmm. earlier rather than later. Okay. And because some of that, the logic that I, I feel is that it's going to impart a tonal shift of its own rather than be surprised by putting that in later and finding that what you thought you liked and you just wanted to dynamically glue it together a little bit has changed the tone. Right. So I try to do that first. And usually that's a successful approach unless you have something that has, you know, a huge amount of low end mm -hmm. on the way in. And then you might have to EQ some of that 
down so it doesn't, uh, you know, the compressor isn't reacting to only this, sure. you know, huge amount of, of beef in the bottom. Uh, but a lot of things, including this, they have a, a, a side chain high pass. This one is at 250 hertz, which is pretty high. But that means that the low end, the beef, will allow to roar through without aggravating, you know, the the stuff. You know, usually the mid range is, is where all the magic is in a mix, where all, all the the important stuff is, uh, and the stuff that you may or may not want to glue and or reveal stuff in the production that wasn't uh, so apparent. Uh, so by high passing the side chain to the compressor, uh, you can allow yourself a lot more of a musical and happy ending. This one has one, and it, uh, this is a pendulum audio tube compressor. That one, and then I think that one's about 120. And then, and on, on some of these other like plugins, you you can you can vary the high pass, you know, so you can get just enough of the roar to to go through, and sometimes making the music swing by having the compressor, having the kick drum, for example, trigger just a little bit, and you make it the whole track dance or make, make it a little more punchy just amazing but just by a little amount i mean not, not i'm not talking about like a mix where you're trying to crush it but you know just you know like a a little bit of meter movement at, at something like one and a half to one or two to one some really low compression ratio will suddenly make a a, a, a thing that sounded pretty good sound really good and you're hardly doing anything but th that's a that's one of the tricks we we find ourselves using Lot. Bob Katz, who's a great mastering engineer, in fact, he wrote the book about mastering. Uh, I like his expression is that mastering can improve the mix by one letter grade. You send us a B plus mix, hopefully we'll send you an A plus master. But you can't really, you know, send us a D mix and expect to get an A. I mean, that's, you know, that probably needs, means we need to call you and ask for a remix because the voice is too low or the bass is too hot or something. We're not trying to change the balance in somebody's mix. We're trying to change the way you perceive the mix. And sometimes that's with little stuff like I was just mentioning where you make the thing dance a little bit. You haven't made anything louder, but you, you've enhanced the feel, if you will, of the track without changing the guy's balance. You know, they, you know, mixers spend hours, sometimes days, getting to the thing that they've sent you. So you don't want to like just start from scratch and pretend that you're going to assert your will on the thing. No. There's a lot of stuff in mastering nowadays that you can do that probably didn't have to be done back in the day when vinyl was the uh, delivery medium, when everything was analog and people were mixing records on large fo format analog consoles. Nowadays, so much stuff gets done in the box, you know, and it needs a little character, I would say. Fantastic. I, probably most of the stuff I, I would think that if I had to characterize how much I do was analog and how much was well, all in the box, it's probably 80% of the time it needs both. It needs a little of both. This stuff really can impart a, a broad stroke of color, you know, of either sheen or, or muscle or what have you. But for real forensics, sometimes, uh, you know, because this thing is like, half db steps mm -hmm. and in a room like like i'm fortunate to find myself working in a half db is a lot i mean i find myself working in tenths quarter dbs is a lot you know and especially on the monitors that i have in here i'm really able i i, I find myself using less eq but like broader q uh, like a wider area and you, so you, you're, you're revealing stuff rather than changing the balance and pointing something. You're just kind of like, this has been lurking there, and now, now you're much more aware of it, and you just breathe down it. That's what's cool about some of the the software because you can really, you can really find. And like I say, I, uh, when I used to work at Universal, I thought I had a great sounding room, but in here, like I say, I can a couple of tenths or three tenths of a dB is a lot. And I can really hear it. And I know it's not like, does that make it any better? I know it's making it better. You know what I mean? You have that confidence because you trust what you're hearing. I think for, for people who learn how to be engineers, heaven help us mastering engineers, by looking at stuff on the internet, it's, 
incredibly important that the that the, the most important tool is your monitoring. That you, if you can't trust 100% what you're hearing, how can you do anything that you know you can that you can say with confidence is leaving the the way you thought it was? So we're segueing rather beautifully into monitor discussion. So I listened to these off camera well, a couple of hours ago now, and they sound unbelievable. One of the things that Peter was telling me and I felt is, is ridiculous. If you sit here in like the perfect listening position, there is an area about here where it's everything is completely in the center, but they're so directional. If I move my head to the left, it's suddenly really weighted to the left. I move my head to the right, it's really, it's insane. Yeah. You're going inch one way or the other and it's like, there's no vagueness. You know you moved off, off axis. Yeah. And when you were, if you look, if you be in the sweet spot, it looks like those the, the, the tweeters are aimed six feet behind me, like at the door. This is one incredibly important thing that I learned when we were at Universal. The room I had at Universal was easily six or eight times the size of this room. It was 30 by 20 by 15. I always thought that room was great, and why it was great was we spent the first, oh, five, six days in there with the speakers, like a quarter inch this way, five degrees this way, half an inch other, finding the physical placement of the boxes in the room. Now there were, there, in that room, there were probably six or eight feet away from the wall. In here, I got them right almost up against the wall. But I did the same here, where I spent a long time getting the imaging and the, the, the height and the depth and everything to be great here with no EQ. There is EQ available on here. I have it out. That's that old uh, expression. Get it at the root, not the fruit. You know, <laughs> if you get if you get the the speakers to 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 sound true without EQ, then it's 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 so much easier to trust. And then you don't have to like put band aids and put EQ in. Like like even at Universal, we had some huge dips. In, in some of the EQ just to make up for anomalies in the, in the room to begin with. It's it's very, very important and great time, probably the best time you'll ever spend as far as the return from the time is to get the monitors sounding great and it's just a little fiddling, you know, play music you know and know well and, you know, a couple of degrees this way, away from the wall, you're going to get more beef as you or more, more boom as you get the, uh, and these these speakers are are enclosed uh i had some other speakers in here for a minute uh dyne audios that were rear ported and it was just a boom tastic boom fest they sounded just god awful <laughs> in this room in other rooms i've heard them and they sound spectacular fiddle around to find to get them just to start to sound the best they can without doing anything as far as eq so tell tell me a bit about them they're, they're made by a gentleman named Andrew Lipinski. And yeah. I, if you haven't heard of them, I had never heard of them until uh, at Universal, the, the chap in the uh, other big mastering room, Eric Lapson, he had actually a bigger system than this. His head, because it was you know at least twice the size of this room, he had two of these base modules. So there were a total of, let's see, another three. So that's eight little woofers and two subs. <laughs> A lot of low one, but the room is huge, right? And they sounded great in there. Uh, and when I got in here, this room, Shelly Yakis had been working in here, but he didn't have this. The room sounded awfully dry, you know, really kind of muffled. Yeah. So I thought, put a little wood underneath, and not only to roll the chair around, but also livened up the room just enough. I auditioned, I think I, I tried um, the Ocean Way, the HD2s, I yep. think they are. Had those in here for a second, and I thought I liked them. In here, the mid-range was actually too up front. And I thought, well, I'm going to start, you know, making wrong judgments uh, if I if I use those in here. You could learn them. But when I heard these in here, and I thought, oh, my God. It's almost like, yeah. You don't, you don't want to hear certain things because you'll fall in love with them. Yeah. They have Class D power yeah. amps built on. And when we were over at Universal, he had an earlier, I think they were AB. So these are even faster than the ones he had at uni. 
So I think these are even more accurate. That's another concern for, for people who are building their own studios is you don't necessarily need uh, the, the prettiest sounding. You, you do need the ones that are, are revealing. You know, remember back in the day when the, the big rage was putting uh, Kim wipes over your NS10 tweeters sure. to make you work harder because they, 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 they were kind of bright and they made you think that you had enough top end when you, if you believe that you were going to end up with a kind of a dull, soft sounding mix. Um, so it's a similar thing that if you're going to choose monitors, don't necessarily choose ones that are like the prettiest or, you know, the brightest when you go to the, 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 the audio store and, and listen to speakers. It's interesting with the NS10s because I, I always remember that when I only worked on NS10s, is if a guitar sound and a snare drum was incredibly offensive, then I knew it was going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, right. It had to be like, <laughs> Yeah, I remember when Genelex first oh, yeah. first came on the scene. I, I remember the first day you push put up the snare drum fader. Fuck, I'm a genius. Listen to that. Yeah, it sounded awesome because you, you're not used to hearing stuff that sounded quite that good, and <laughs> it made you think you were done when you weren't. We were listening earlier at you know a dim volume, and then a, probably like an 85 dB and a little bit louder, and, and they sounded the same at all yeah. areas and. Well, some of that's, oh, well, a lot of that's the room because Great. you don't have the room participating too much and you can hear the linearity of, Great. of the, the sound, which, you know, the way I work, I, I have my monitor at, you know, what I call loud and I and never touch it. And the only other thing I do is hit dim. The phone rings or if I want it and when I'm, when I'm printing something and I want to like police it and, and make sure that there's nothing that stands out or, you know, nothing goes up bump in the night while I'm, I'm recording the file, I go to dim. So I only have 12 o'clock and dim. That's <laughs> it. That's something, that's something that all you people out there would do well to learn early. And that is to not start, don't fiddle around with the volume control because you, you, you're making, you know, just use, you know, because if you turn it up, it's going to sound better. So don't fool yourself. Leave it at, you know, one of two positions. Uh, Don Murray was, uh, he was the, the guy who worked from at Philadelphia and uh, he cut money, 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 money. Oh, amazing track, yep. yeah. I mean, you know. But anyway, he, he was probably the first guy. Yeah. Anthony Jackson. The first the first guy I ever saw who whoever did that in the mix. He'd come in, start the day, park it there, and not touch it all day except maybe dim the answer the phone. Because then you never, you're never, you've not confused yourself. Believe me, it's a, it's a very, very good thing to learn to, to not fool yourself by fiddling with the volume. Leave it at one place, and then your alternate is dim. Pete, thank you ever so much. It's been really a real pressure it. working against you. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a lot of fun, and we could do more, and we probably should, because we we scraped the surface of of a lot of amazing records that you've worked on. So, sure, we can Man, do I, some more. Well, that's a, I'm up for it. I feel a little embarrassed that you spent all this time with me. No, this is so much fun. I mean, I've done a bunch of, you know, little interviews, but they're usually like, you know, 8, 10, 15 minutes tops. Yeah, we like to go in deep. It's, it's yeah. fun. <laughs> all right, yeah. please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. You can check out, we'll have all of the different sites, and of course, Aftermaster and a whole bunch of other things. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing.